Okay. 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 Well, uh, welcome back. This is the third session in uh, today's first day of the three day webinar series concerning systematic reviews. Uh, we've covered various aspects of uh, framing the question. And uh, I'd just like to bring us back to the issue of study design in the question and uh, put back to you the summary of what we've covered. So first I've said that there is confusion in the term use of case control. So case control can refer to case control design, but frequently there are errors in uh, use of this term case control in the published literature. And I highlighted that this study where people are allocated to receive control exposure or experimental exposure or a new treatment compared to control treatment, and then they are followed up for their outcome. This is not a case control study. This is a cohort study. And the case control study, the starting point is uh, outcomes, where you have outcome present, which is cases, or outcomes absent, which is control. And then you go back in time to determine whether exposure was present or absent. And then you calculate the effect size, and this is called case control. So to summarize, the term control is used in the literature, and sometimes it is used to define exposure. For example, in the term randomized control trial, the term control refers to the controlled use of standard treatment or placebo uh, as exposure. The term controls and cases frequently together in the form of case dash. explain in your writing what you mean. And if somebody is telling you things and you are not clear, request them to clarify what they mean, because then you will avoid confusion. So I'm going to stop here and return back to colleagues who were asking me questions about this to come back again so that we can be sure that we have understood this correctly. Okay, so we have, uh, so Esther says you have understood it well. Mitya also says you have understood. Thank you both. Um, anybody else has comments or questions? Kathy says all good. And thank you for your wink. Um, right. So next we move to the term. Data are collected or the protocol is written before collected data, for example, in a routinely collected database, are examined. According to this definition, it is possible for a case control study to be prospective. According to this definition, it is also possible for a cohort study to be retrospective if we contrast the definition of prospective with retrospective in that a retrospective study 
does not have a protocol written before the data are collected. You will have heard, especially if you are doing randomized control trials, there is a demand or request for, for um, registration of studies on what is called prospective registers. And from this, I think it would be possible for you to see immediately and obviously that the word prospective refers to gotcha. the randomized trial design is given before the patients are randomized. So I would appreciate any comments or questions that you might now have about prospective or retrospective. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, is there a mistake on this slide? Um, Tell me, there might be. Um, in the lower right corner where you have uh, outcome absent, those are controls. Shouldn't the controls be receiving control exposure? And the cases should be receiving experimental exposure. Here. Uh, I don't hear anything. We don't hear you. Just one second. Uh, apologies for that. Are you able to hear me now? Are there other people who are unable to hear me also? No, it's better now. All right, you can hear me. All right. Yes. So I wanted to highlight here for you that the word control can be used to describe exposure, like in the term randomized control trial. It can also be used to describe absence of outcome in a case control study. So. I'm afraid there isn't a mistake, but there is certainly confusion. And I am glad at least three people in the audience have said that my description has been clear to them. And I hope that after addressing this point just made that absence of outcome is also described as controls uh, in case control study, then I hope it is even clearer. Um, another please question here. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, because we can ha have outcome present uh, in uh, experimental group, and also in the control group, because here uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, assume there is one hundred percent correlation between experimental exposure and the outcome, which is not the case in the most times. Well, uh, this does not happen in real life, so we can hundred percent agree that there cannot be one hundred percent correlation between experimental exposure and outcome. Well, look, man, if you, if you, in that case, you can say that there is a hundred percent correlation. In this type of situation, you do not need to perform a randomized control trial or, or a cohort study or other types of experiments. You have your answer from a case series. In fact, you probably don't even need to experiment with the case series. Do, do you see what I mean?
But in other situations, okay, breaking up badly. Sorry, Evo. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Is my comment about experimental exposure and outcome clear? No, Shiraz, can you repeat, can you comment can on you repeat? The, the audio is working okay. Now it's working okay. Can you repeat the, uh, the last thing that you uh, tried to... Okay. Look, whenever we think about doing a study where we can allocate people to receiving experiment or control or new treatment or standard treatment, in these situations, we do not expect a 100% correlation between outcome present and exposure present. Is, is that clear? Yes. Okay, and I was giving you the example that if you jump from an aeroplane without a parachute, in this case, there will be a 100% relationship between exposure to jumping from the aeroplane and the outcome which will be death. Yes, but using in parachute, this type of situation, you will not need a control trial. Yes, but in the control so, trial, so when we perform a control trial, we do not have a hundred percent expectation that the outcome will be fully uh, imp would be fully realized under experimental exposure. Yes, but if we had in the control group, the people who jumped with the parachutes, not everybody survives. Well, in that case, there is no 100% correlation. So I, I, I think your question arose because you probably thought that when outcome is present in all the experimental in the uh, group, then you could call them cases. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Well, but I'm just trying to highlight to you that if you refer the term cases only with reference to outcome and to case control design, the likelihood of becoming confused will be reduced. I'm simply trying to give you some tricks to, to avoid the confusion because I don't want you after attending three days of my session to be one of the 33% of editors or peer reviewers who make this mistake. No, that part was understood uh, clearly. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. We didn't hear the first part. Eva, thank you for pointing that out. I hope, Eva, you don't have any remaining question. I have clarified that. Uh, I'd like to take you to this type of terminology list given in many textbooks. I'm not going to go through them all, except to point out where the term cohort study is used, they are using the term prospective or historical. They are not using the word here retrospective. And I pointed out to you that 30% of the time, the term case control is wrongly reported in the published scientific literature. And here I like to point out to you in the middle of this image that in addition to the term prospective and retrospective, there is a third term used in some literature called ambispective. So, I think my suggestion to you is, please be clear about the distinction between cohort and case control. 
if you use my definition of prospective and retrospective, the chances are that the confusion will be reduced. Uh, I think you need to think in terms of longitudinal and cross-sectional, not just in terms of prospective and retrospective. And then I think you, I want you to remember that randomized controlled trial is a type of cohort study. It is not a case control study. So if you can take these, have these take home messages, then I'll be the happiest person feeling that I have achieved my objective as a teacher in today's session. And uh, here I remind you that the term retrospective study is not universally used in terms of a cohort study. So welcome to the real world of research where the terminology is confusing, uh, where even the experts, the peer reviewers and the editors and the authors themselves are confused at least a third of the time about the term case control. So you have the great potential in your group of 50 or 80 colleagues to fix this problem once and forever uh, by being part of the discussion we are having just now. Okay, so I think the first lesson for anybody who wishes to do a systematic review is to realize that they are going to face confusion in the literature. And they need themselves to be as clear as possible about things. At the time of commencing the review, so that they don't get misled by the errors reported in the literature. I also urge you to uh, think, to, to definitely consider making a prospective registration of your systematic review ahead of completing your literature searches, because that will force you to think about what is it that you really want to do in your review and make it feasible for you to avoid errors and report in a transparent way. So while well, here is another example of this confusion, but we'll skip over this. We have approximately 20 minutes left in today's session. I would like to end by inviting you to think about how to write the title of your paper or your chapter concerning your systematic review. And I'll give you some examples from other published studies. Um, so we already seen that nearly a hundred minutes of discussion has passed and we are still only talking about the question, how to structure the question, how to construct a hypothesis from it, how not to become confused at the time of framing the question. And then you will have to do a review which will in your thesis very likely be uh, several thousand words covered over several pages with many tables and appendices. All of this in the title of your chapter or your paper will need to be summarized very succinctly. So look, landing on the moon took many billions of dollars, uh, many millions of uh, effortful activities, many thousands of companies involved, probably tens of thousands of people involved in making this trip possible, 
only a few people landed on the moon and then they returned safely. And look, the whole thing is summarized by a Wisconsin State Journal, the newspaper, in three words, on the moon. And then there is detail and other text. So you can see the challenge faced in writing the title. In journals, the expectation is that the title need to be very succinct. I would say it need not be any longer than the length of a tweet, which is about 120 characters. But look at your chosen journal or the instructions of your university with respect to titles as to what length is permitted and don't exceed that. Be specific. Do not include question marks in the title. Uh, as I said, comply with the journal's instructions. If what you're writing does not allow you to give an abstract below the title, you can use a declarative title where you can say what your findings were from the review. And I give you an example here of a title of one of the, my published uh, systematic reviews, in this case also with a meta-analysis. And look at the question components covered in the title. So first you can see that the design of the study is included. In fact, design of the study is like a must for the title. You cannot just give the title to a scientific paper without describing what study design you have used, if you are a serious scientist. Then the intervention is described. But you can see that the outcome is not described. Somebody who knows this subject, reads this, will have to guess what the title is, or what, what the outcome is. Uh, maybe that's a deficiency. Or if they can jump from here to the abstract, they will find the outcome over there. Another title, this time of a systematic review protocol that is published. So the study design, which is systematic review is given. The intervention is given, which are the tests for prediction. And the outcome is also given, which is the complications of preeclampsia. So here you can see less words have been used in the title, but has more complete information relative to the previous one where we have far more words in the title. You can see there are three lines, two and a half lines at least, yet it is missing one of the components of the question. So framing the question is not only important for you to be clear about your own hypothesis, but it's actually fundamental because you're going to put this stuff from your participants, your exposures, your control treatments, your outcomes, your study design, into your title. Now, colleagues who proposed their question before, would you like to come back and suggest Okay, my question is, uh, Mitch, uh, perhaps you can come back with a description of your question again, but this time include the study design and suggest what could be the title of your paper or your uh, thesis chapter.
Okay, uh, may, maybe if Mitya doesn't come forward, another colleague could come forward. The question about the dental uh, caries following radiotherapy, perhaps we could take that question and take it forward. Yeah, it could be probably silver diamine fluoride as a novel treatment method for post-radiation caries. It's a um, cohort study. Okay. Uh, now you use the word as a novel treatment. Why did you use this term, novel? Well, according to one of my latest um, literature, um, well, what I've read, it's not usually used for post-radiation caries. It's used for early childhood caries, for root caries in the older pop um, population. Uh, to my knowledge, there has been there have been no clinical trials published on that okay. Uh, uh, topic. Okay. So look, thank you for clarifying that. I urge colleagues in the meeting to be very careful about the use of the word novel or new or the first time or first use or never been done before. Uh, because in a serious scientific journal, the idea that something is novel will be questioned because most of the times in the modern day, the idea that something is novel is usually the result of a bad search. Novelty is very highly valued in society, but in science, Uh, the fact that you are repeating something to double check that it works or you are repeating it in a slightly different way to double check that it works or that it is reproducible is an extremely valid, useful and highly relevant scientific effort. Novelty is not the requirement for good science. Okay, so your question covered the intervention that it was novel and that you will study it by a cohort design. So that's very good. And your title covered all of these items. Uh, why did you say it's a cohort design? Um, there would, we would uh, have the patients that come to our clinic are a group of people they have been diagnosed and treated for one condition with one treatment. Mm -hmm. So then you don't have any standard treatment. Everybody receives the same. Um, well, they receive the same treatment, the, the same treatment for, for uh, the um, head and neck cancer but they will receive two different treatments for prevention or rest of the caries. Okay, all right. Okay, I understand, I understand. Thank you. Uh, perhaps not today, but tomorrow or day after, you can also explain why the allocation to treatment, the new, the novel treatment and the standard is not by randomization, uh, but that's not necessary today for the discussion concerning construction of the question and the title. Mecha, you want to, ah, you've, you've sent your, your title or your question on the, on the chat, I read it out. A new objective AI assisted evaluation tool for assessment of breast reconstruction results. Okay, but well, that sounds, fine to me. You have also emphasized novelty by using the word new objectives, uh, which is fine if you are confident that it has never been done before. Uh, 
Uh, but what will be your study design? That is missing from this title. The problem is that I don't really have a study design. It is it would be like a cohort study, but you know it's just uh, uh, evaluating these patients and uh, improving this uh, this measurement tool. Okay, look, if you don't give the design, there are paper published without design. That is okay. Uh, so you you are not going to be the first one without a design in your title. But in the absence of a design, really the reader does not get anywhere. You're going to have to say something about how were the patients, her data from patients collected. I think if you were simply going to say this title without any design concerning patients, to me, it could mean that you are going to describe the computer algorithm. It might be a paper in computer science as far as I'm concerned. It may not be a paper with respect to health. Make sense? You are going to study patients, right, Mitya? So a better way to say it would be like a, a cohort study of a new objective, uh, AI assisted and so on. If you are going to do a cohort study, yes, that would be correct. I think you can say a cohort study of, or at the end of the title, you can write a subtitle just called a cohort study. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah, it does. All right. Now we have approximately five minutes left. From your research question. And I also want to tell you a little bit about how to write the background section of your paper, um, which usually deploys search for previous literature on your question. I apologize, I used the word tomorrow. Well, our next session will be in two days, not tomorrow. So you will have one whole day left to think about what we have covered today. Uh, my suggestion would be that if you all write down your own question, one question that you are going to address in, the, in your thesis work and construct some literature searches to see what has been published in that field before, that would help you prepare for the session on Wednesday much, much better. I leave the last minutes for any comments or questions. Ah, there is a, another question put in the in in the chat by Robert. The question is antibiotic prophylaxis in preventing hypospadias surgery complication, comma a randomized control trial. Well, this is an excellent title. It has the intervention described, the condition described, and the outcome described. Presumably a set of complications is going to be the outcome for your uh, antibiotic prophylaxis success measurement. And in addition, the design is also described, which is prospective randomized control trial. Now, if you think about this, if you say randomized trial, for most people in their mind, it would automatically in the world of today mean that it is a prospective study. So if you needed more words to describe the complication more accurately, 
you could control the word count of the title by just saying that your design is a randomized trial rather than a prospective randomized trial. Thank you, Robert, for, for that suggested title. For day after tomorrow, uh, please feel free to do some literature search on this question. You, you can look for some randomized trials on this topic and uh, be prepared to talk about this in two days when we meet again at four o'clock. Right, so I'm glad to see that still 59 of you are, or 58 of you are still there in this webinar. I appreciate your contribution. Um, I hope you know that teachers learn from students. Every time I deliver this teaching, I learn how to teach it better, especially with respect to confusion about terminology. So I'm glad that you were active in this discussion uh, about how to say things clearly, avoiding confusion. If there are no more comments or question, <coughs> questions, then I think we can bring today's webinar to an end. And we start the next uh, webinar in two days at 4 p.m. your time. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, and we will start with a little summary, and then we'll jump into how the question can be taken forward to construct a search, and how the search is important, not just for systematic review, but for identifying literature, for helping to write the introduction section of any paper.